Last week, Pastor Todd gave us a message on um, our vision to grow. And it's a vision based on Jesus' vision for his disciples. And he, he, uh, he says in John chapter 4, verse 35, Wake up and look around. Say, wake up. Wake up, wake up and look around. The fields are already white for harvest. And that's what we want to see around us, that every person in your family, every friend that you have who hasn't received Jesus yet, every encounter with any person, that person can be a harvest unto God. Say, unto God. Not unto you, but not unto Mosaic Church, but unto God. And that's what Jesus wants for us to see. My mic is still not working properly. Should I change mics? Or this is good? This is good? This is good? All right. All right. Okay. Let's go to our message. For 2020, here's the thing. Pastor Top preached on the harvest, and we do want to see growth happen in our church and in our lives, in our obedience, in our, in our discipleship. And so for 2020, let me give you some, some numbers here that we want to pray for in 2020. So here, here are things. So first of all, this is our vision for growth, for each of us to continue to reach others and make disciples of Jesus. We will never stray away from that. Why? Because that's the commission of Jesus to the church before he went back to heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit for us to be able to fulfill this so we won't ever ever deter or stray away from this vision of making disciples so we want to pray that our worship attendance will double in size can I hear an amen that's our prayer for 2020 and then for evangelism we want to pray that 150 people will receive Jesus as Lord and Savior for 2020 150 say that with me for 2020 150 let's say that together again for 2020 150. So we're praying for that. And of course, we're praying that in discipleship, that a hundred of those people will actually follow Jesus in baptism. And so over the last five years of existence of Mosaic Church, we've seen almost 500 people give their lives to Christ. Amen. That's a great thing to celebrate about. So we're thankful. And so we have, a, we have a vision for growth, and the growth happens one life at a time. We want to see, today we'll be talking about justice, rolling like a river, and we want to see expansion of our influence for the kingdom of God. And so today we will focus on the second part, which is a vision for justice. Say justice. In some parts of this sermon, I actually borrowed from a good friend of mine um, who invited me to Africa in September. His name, his name is Pastor Todd Petkow from Rivers, Riverwood Church. And um, we shared, or he shared some points with me to share with you. Um, and, and we pray that God will speak to us through these words. And so aside from growing in numbers, and some people will say, oh, why are you so obsessed with numbers? Because Jesus is. He's willing to leave the 99 behind to find that one. He is. Because every number has a name. Every name has a story and every story matters to God. That is why we are obsessed with, with numbers. We want to see justice, however, to roll like a river. And we don't just want numbers. We want to see justice. Say justice. And so... Here's the thing, why do we want to put justice or make justice a part of our vision? What is justice anyway? We'll talk more about that in this message. But here's the thing, we want to see growth, we want to see expansion, but we also want to see justice. Growth one life at a time, expansion of the influence of the church of Jesus, but also justice to roll like a river. Why justice? Because here's the thing. We live in a broken world. We live in a broken world. The brokenness is so severe that it's so obvious in almost everything around us. The proof is everywhere that the world is broken. See, the world is broken. It's all around you. It's probably even in your life right now. The brokenness. You experience it on a daily basis. You see it, whether it's in the news headlines that you read on, uh, on the newspaper every morning, or if you still read the newspaper, <laughs> or maybe you see on the internet, or it could be a social media post. The evidence that the world is broken is everywhere. The world is broken. Turn to your neighbor and say, the world is broken. Now, who broke it? 
Did God break it? No, he didn't. We did. We did. We broke the world. He created, God created a perfect world. And we messed it up by deciding that we can run our lives better than God can. And ever since we broke this world, God's mission has always been to fix it. God's mission has always been to draw people back who rebelled against Him. Drawing them back with His love. God created a perfect world. We broke it. And ever since the world broke, like I said, God's mission has always been to call people back. To restore this broken world. Say broken world. And the very reason Jesus was born was to fix that biggest damage that we've created. And what is that? The damaged bridge or relationship with, with God. We broke off of it. Jesus came to bridge that gap once again. Jesus came to make us friends with God. Again, that's what Romans chapter 5 verse 11 says. That through the sacrifice of Jesus, we have been made friends with God. Say friends with God. The world is broken, God has been trying to fix it, and He sent Jesus to fix the most enormous damage. Through Jesus, God is fixing this world one life at a time. And God is calling His people, us, to bring healing to this damaged world. That sounds like a very big job, isn't it? But your mandate really is not to change the world. Your real mandate is to change the world around you. Say around you. Because if you think of how big the damage is, <laughs> one individual or one community can't really fix it. But you as an individual disciple of Jesus Christ can actually bring repair and healing to the world around you. Our community can bring healing to the broken world around us. Say around us. And like I said, God is calling each of us to bring healing to this broken world. One life at a time. The Jews call this virtue tikkun olam. Can you say that with me? Tikkun olam. That means the repair of the world. In fact, they believe that when the Messiah comes, the repair will be complete. Tikkun olam. But as we wait, let's be a part of the repair. But here's the thing. The road from fixed, and well, the, from broken to fixed is not a straight highway, right? The, the road from broken to fix is not easy. And as my friend Todd Petkow said, in that on that road from broken to fixed, you have to go through or be confronted by the force of the unknown. The force of the unknown. What is that? <laughs> oh my gosh, what is happening? We don't know what's happening next, and we will see that in the next slide. The force of the unknown. But in that high, on that highway, we also will be going through the valley of bewilderment. Say bewilderment. What is that? We become overwhelmed by the realities. And then we go through the swamp of confusion. We get confused by options and opinions. And then finally, we hit the mountain of failed attempts. You will find yourself on this mountain a few times before you figure out the way to fix things. The road from broken to fix is not a straight highway. But God is calling us still, even if it is a difficult road to take, to bring healing to this broken world. Can I hear an amen? And that is where justice comes in. In the book of Amos, we see God who is severely disappointed. With whom? With his people. Remember, in the Old Testament, thank you, Luke. In the Old Testament, 
That works better. <laughs> In the old. It, mm, uh. it, uh, hello. Hey, can you hear me? All right. May this never happen again, God. <laughs> Ever again, in the name of Jesus. Ever, ever, ever again. <laughs> Christmas Eve, Easter, may it never happen again. May we be on top of things as you give us wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Remember in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah particularly, God gave Israel an assignment. I was talking to Luke earlier today. Why? What is the mission of Israel? Why did God choose Israel of all the nations of the world? And what is their mission? What is their purpose? He could have chosen the Chinese. He could have chosen other groups. But why? And what is their mission? In, in Isaiah chapter 49 verse 6, you will see that the mission that God gave to Israel was this. That you may be a light unto the nation so that my salvation may be known to them. If you read Isaiah chapter 49 verse 6, that's what God told the people of Israel. This is your mission. This is why I chose you. I want you to be a light unto the nations. Now us, the modern people of God, that's the same thing. That's the same calling for us. We are called to be light unto the nations that the nations may know the salvation of our God. But instead of being light, instead of leading others or other nations unto God, God's people became just like the nations they should be reaching out to. They maintained their religion and their religious activities, their religiosity, but they forgot to live out their calling. That's why in Amos you will find a very disappointed God. In fact, I want to read Amos chapter 5, beginning with verses 21 all the way to 24, just four verses from the message translation, which is a translation that, that sort of conveys the emotional tone of God. And here's, here's, here are the verses. God said, I can't stand your religious meetings. I am fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religious projects or religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I am sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations, social media, and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. Musicians, can I hear an amen? No, you shouldn't say amen to this. <laughs> when was the last time you truly sang to me? Do you know what I want? I want justice. I want fairness. Rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. Can you feel the tone, the emotion that God is trying to convey here? Remember, these verses were written by a prophet named Amos from the Lord to the people of his heart. But Israel, during those days, were experiencing great prosperity. They were experiencing great wealth and military success. They never forgot to get together for worship to, at the temple. They never forgot to be at Bible studies. They never forgot to get together. They had religion. They had wealth and they had prosperity. They had political stability. They were great. But God still says, I am sick of it. Now you read this, and you think, wow, that's a lot of singing and music and preaching, big gatherings, conventions, holy gatherings. They have a very active social media presence. As far as image goes, everything looked good. And reading this particular part of scripture sounds like being in a mega church, isn't it? Oh, we will have a big conference this year. Oh man, thousands of people will be coming. Oh, our music is going to be amazing. Our social media is great. We have lots of buildings and projects. And there's nothing wrong with all that. 
And like I said, everything was going well for the people of Israel, but God is so severely disappointed with his children because something is missing. What is that? Justice. Justice. You're doing awesome, awesome stuff, all that great things that you're doing, oh, amazing, but you're not giving proper fitting and carefully measured verdicts. There's no justice. Your judgment is skewed, and it's preventing you from living out your calling as my people. Everything is going well for you except that I want justice. Can you imagine this? God crying out to the people of God, saying, I want justice. What is God saying? What is justice? See, the word that God used here for justice in Hebrew is mishpat. Say mishpat. Mishpat. Say that again. Mishpat. A proper, fitting, and carefully measured verdict. And whenever I hear the word justice, I think of judgment, right? You think of judgment. And my friend P Pastor Todd said, whenever I hear the word ju justice or judgment, I, I feel like I see in my mind a picture of a judge holding a mallet, calling out verdicts, right? And he said, this friend of mine said, we have little judges in our hearts calling out wrong verdicts, improper, fitting, or not fitting, verdicts around us. Skewed by our tradition, skewed by our culture, our taste, and anything else that might influence our verdict. And the truth is, like I said, this little judge inside of us that carry a mallet pronouncing judgments on others based on our taste, our opinions, our biases, or what we little or what little we know about them is creating imbalance in the community that God wants for us to have. Pastor, how does that happen? How, how do we, how do, how are we guilty of injustice in our modern times now? Think about it. This little judge inside of us, when we look at people and we immediately take that mallet and we pronounce personal verdicts on these people that we meet. Loser. Nerd. Immigrant, black, white, uneducated, elitist, stupid, socially awkward, outcast, ratchet, slut, idiot. Muslim, gay, lesbian, terrorist, fake, insecure, trash, fat, skinny, divorced, redneck, country bumpkin, unstable, Trump supporter, Trudeau lover, Lazy, liberal, conservative, what else? And we allow those wrong verdicts to dictate our interactions with others and we end up preventing ourselves from fully becoming the light that God wants for us to be. Because we have placed people in boxes and we label it unreachable, untouchable undeserving of the love of God. Stay in the dark. And that was happening during the time of Amos. Yes, you were doing a lot of good religious stuff. You're building a lot of good things. But you're pronouncing 
wrong verdicts about people around you. There is great injustice in the world around you, and it's making me sick. Our judgments become boxes in which we lock people in, and it keeps us from loving them as God wants us to. Oh, you're an outsider. You belong somewhere else. This is our religious gathering. Please find some other place. That was happening during the time of Amos. Contradicting the original calling that God had for them. I want you to be the light to the nations so that the nations will know my salvation. I want you to be the light to the nations. But how can you be light to the nations if you will limit your interactions with the nations based on your skewed and limited judgment of them? Now what is the proper verdict? What is the proper verdict? Turn to your neighbor and say, hey, what is the proper, proper verdict? What is it? What is the proper verdict for us? God established the proper verdict for all people from the very beginning of the Bible. And we find that in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. The Word of God says, So God created human beings in His own image. The Greek word for image is icon. Or of course we will get the word, the English word icon. And it says... In the image or the icon of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. What is an icon? It's an image, a likeness, a representation. And every person bears the image of God. Humanity is stamped with the image of God. Can I hear an amen? When God created Adam and Eve, he stamped his perfect image on them. But like we said earlier... We live in, the bro in a broken world because Adam and Eve decided to disobey God. And when they disobeyed God, that image was soiled, it was crumpled, it was torn, it was messed up. And even though that image is broken, that image is still in people. It's still there. And in God's eyes, Adam and Eve, even though they have sinned against Him, are still worth, or were still worth, the same love. And they're worth the same attention. That is why since then, like I said, God's been in the business of restoring that image one life at a time through Jesus. That's the story of the Bible. If somebody asks you what is the whole story of the Bible, there you go. And there you have it. It is that broken image of God in us. That sin <laughs> that broke it. It's what's causing the brokenness, so much brokenness in this world. Ever since. In fact, even personally, when we don't see ourselves as God does, we do stupid things that contradict who God is. Jesus came to restore that image. And when people receive Christ as Lord and Savior, that image is restored. And as God's people in this broken world, we must believe, say we must believe, that no matter how broken a person may appear, Jesus wants to restore the image of God in them. Nobody is beyond restoration. And just like he restored his image in you, each time you look at somebody, I want you to see the image of God in them. But, on the contrary, each time we pronounce wrong verdicts on people, we are guilty of injustice. And so God told his people, Amos, I want justice to roll like a river. Say, roll like a river. I don't want a garden hose variety of justice. What is a garden hose variety of justice? 
take a garden hose, like, I'm, okay, I'm gonna put, bring justice to these group of plants right here. Oh, look, okay, I'm done, I'm happy. I'll do it again tomorrow. That's, that's garden hose. The following day, oh, look, injustice happening here. Let's, let's just, just, all right, I'm done. God said, I don't want that. I want justice to roll like a river. Who among you here has been to the Grand Canyon in Arizona? Massive hole on the earth. But it was caused by erosion because of a river. And God is saying to us, I want that type of justice. I want that type of generosity. I want that type of fairness for my people. That it's going to be so strong, it could change landscapes. That it can change environments. It can change cities. I believe that if we let God use us, the strong river of justice can change the landscape of the world around us. And like I said to you earlier, our mandate is not to change the world. Our mandate is to change the world around us. Is there justice rolling like a river in your life? Or are you satisfied with a garden hose variety? Oh, somebody needs a donation? Okay. There. justice in your life and it's it bringing change to the world around you and like I said earlier even as simple as making wrong pronouncements about people that keep you or prevent you from reaching out to them too gay foreigner you're limiting justice. You're guilty of injustice. But here's the thing. The key to justice is proximity. Say proximity. Not just proximity, but close proximity. It is bringing change where God has placed you or where God sends you. It's bringing fairness and balance where God has placed you. So by listening to the word of the Lord spoken to us today as an application, I think God is telling us to change the world around us by number one, fighting injustice by doing what's right. That's our first lesson for today. I believe God wants us to change the world around us by fighting injustice, by doing what's right. What I like about the word mishpat, say that again with me, mishpat, is that it also means to fight for what's right. It's not just pronouncing the right verdict, it's also fighting for what's right. Mishpat. It means trying to fix what is broken. It means if you see injustice, don't turn a blind eye, do something. Don't just make noise. That's a problem with a lot of Christians, and not just Christians, but a lot of people. They see something, they just make a lot of noise. And it's good that, you know, sometimes we, we make a lot of noise so that the attention and people will be aware, right? But that's not enough. We gotta do something, say do something. One Jewish rabbi, his name is Pastor, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of London, he wrote, Mishpat alone cannot repair a broken world. You need to pair it with tzedakah. Say that with me, tzedakah. Now that sounds like a, the last name of a singer, right? Do you know that guy, Neil? Neil Sadaka, what, what's his famous song? Come on, somebody. Tell me, the, tell me a title, and you will be dating yourself. Come on, somebody. Right? We will tell you how old you are. I'm kidding. Um, 
tzedakah. The Hebrew word tzedakah is righteousness, a righteousness. Mishpat is pronouncing the right verdict, but it has to be coupled with doing what is right. In fact, for the modern Jews, giving or volunteering to help others in need, or giving to causes, or fighting for what's right, it's ca is called tzedakah. And what I love about Christianity is that the disciples, but coming from Jesus, took that to a higher level. It's not just doing justice out of duty. How, what do we call this in our tradition? Charity. When you give to something or to a cause or to somebody, that is charity. And charity comes from the word charis, which is grace. It's not just out of duty, you're doing it out of love. And that's the difference there. So we're called to fight injustice by doing what's right. In Micah chapter 6 verse 8, we see the balance between tzedakah and mishpat. Let's read verse 8 together. Together, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, do what's right, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. There's the balance there of not just pronouncing the right verdict, but doing something about it. I love the, par the part where it says to act justly, to do what's right, tzedakah. And so that's the first lesson. Fight injustice by doing what's right. Say that with me all together. Fight injustice by doing what's right. Second lesson or application is this. God wants us to change the world around us by fixing what's broken and being a part, by being a part of the solution. Fixing what's broken by being part of the solution. Stop being a part of the problem. Oh, there's racism in this place. Well, stop contributing to it. Oh, there's, there's economic disparity in this place. Well, start being generous. Be a part of the solution. Like the people in Amos' time, I believe God is calling each of us collectively and individually to engage in bringing justice and repair what's broken in the world around us. You know, since Mosaic started, we've always been... Um, aware of the needs around us. And so part of our mission as a church is we give a part of our offerings to an outreach partner. Is that justice? Absolutely. But I feel like it's also a bigger garden hose variety of justice. And you know where I'm getting at. We can do more. Ever since we started, we've always wanted to be involved in making a difference in the world around us. That is why we don't want to stray away from evangelism and discipleship and outreach. And even if it costs a lot, we try to encourage people, hey, save up, we'll send you to a different place where you can serve God, where you will see the need and bring justice. See, trying to make a difference without making disciples is almost futile. Did you know that? Because here's the thing, our real and primary mission is to make disciples, but we are also called to make a difference, amen? You don't want to make a difference without making disciples. Because here's the thing, listen, trying to make a difference without making disciples is almost futile. Why? Because, all right, you bring justice, but no change happens on the inside, and therefore things revert back to what's always been. But when the heart is changed, a person experiences 180, amen? A 180 degree turn. And the same is true with, with this. Our primary mission is to make disciples. Our secondary call is to make a difference in the world around us, which leads us back to our main mission. So we want to be involved in fixing what's broken by being a part of the solution. Yes, we want people to know Jesus personally. That's our first mission. But we also want to help fix what is broken around us. So instead of contributing to the brokenness, we want to contribute to the healing. Can I say amen to that? 
And so, that's the second lesson. But the third lesson is this, or application, is God wants us to change the world around us by freeing our hands, by becoming available. Say, be available. I told you earlier, justice requires proximity, closeness. You cannot fight injustice or fix what is broken unless you make yourself available for it. And as a church, we want all of us, even those who are not present in this worship experience now, to be truly available. Say available. For what God wants us to do and where God wants us to go. Freeing your hands and being available is making yourself available to, number one, pray, to give, and to go. Say, pray, give, go. I want us to look at some opportunities for 2020. And like I said, this is a vision series. This is what we want to see happen at Mosaic Church. Opportunities to pray, to give, and to go in 2020. Number one, let's look at our local scenario here. Locally, we want to participate in helping those in need in our community by getting our D groups and even as individuals to get involved in local justice causes. What does that mean? You can help out in the men's shelter. Can I hear an amen? You can help sort clothes at the olive tree. You can help with you know, big brothers and big sisters as a mentor. Find a way for you to be able to bring justice in this world. Remember, when you do this, you are bringing fairness. You're bringing balance. You're bringing people to where they ought to be or where God wants for them to be. And so there are local shelters here in this city and soup kitchens for men and women here in Lloydminster. One of my favorite Christmas movies is new. If you haven't seen this movie yet, go watch it. It's called Last Christmas. It's, it's running now. It's, it's now showing. All right. They didn't pay me for this to say this, but one of the things that, that I learned from that story, what I love about the whole plot is that this person who is overly selfish, this female protagonist, so selfish, self-centered, she would do anything and everything just to make her happy. Until she met this person who actually taught her that joy, real happiness, is found in serving others. I'm not going to give you everything about the movie. If you want to go on a date tomorrow or Monday, go ahead and watch the movie. It's really cool. But I love what the, what the character said, the protagonist said. Helping people makes us happy. So be involved in, in local causes. But the second thing that I want for us together as a church to envision for 2020 is we want to partner with a group called Children's Hope Chest. I visited a care point. Now, what is a care point? A care point is a place where kids are get kids go and where they get food, they get discipleship, they get education, some clothing, everything that a kid needs. And, and I visited this care point that didn't have a partner. What is a partner? A partner is a church from a different country who will commit to support that particular care point so that things can happen there. At Hillview, there was only feeding program and discipleship because they didn't have a partner. They didn't have a partner church that would fund what was, what was going on or what needs to go on. And so I was able to visit that place and, and I, was, I was stunned by the great need. Now here am I talking about needs in a different country. Here we are enjoying the comforts of a beautiful theater. I, I, I'm not able to communicate with you the full extent of the need. That when I say poverty or hunger, 
It's probably the kind of poverty that you haven't experienced or the hunger that you haven't felt. I met this young boy and I shared, I think, with you this story a few months ago in my trip whose adult family members have all died away. And that's, that's, that's the term he, he used, away. They all died out because of AIDS. And when he was 10 years old, this is an 11 year old kid, 10 years old when his last adult family member passed away, he didn't know where to go, so he packed his belongings and lived under a mango tree. And the only way he survived living under the mango tree was going to a care point to get food. And he had this little Tupperware that he would fill with food so, because they only serve food in the morning. And so he would get some food, keep some, and after he would go to school, go back to that mango tree and sleep, and that was his day. That was his day. Until one day, a mother came to, to him and said, maybe you, you could come live with us. And so when I met this young boy, 11 years old, he was with another boy, and they introduced themselves as brothers. And then, you know, when I heard the story, one of, the, one of them said, he's not really my brother. We're not really related. But even in that gesture of inviting that young boy, that orphan, to her home, that lady made a difference in the world of that young man. She brought justice. At Hillview, there are 90 kids who are in need of support. And so my prayer is that we will, by next year, sponsor children. Some of you have sponsored children in the past, and perhaps some of you are not sponsoring children from any organization, but I want Mosaic Church to embrace this as part of our justice vision. It only costs $38, and some of you are thinking, oh my gosh, that's a lot of money. That's like four t-shirts. Really? It's $1.27 a day. How much is a Tim Hortons coffee? It's probably more than that, right? But if you will set aside $1.27 a day and send it to somebody in need so that that person, whether he or she, can have access to clean water, have food to eat, be educated, be discipled, be taught computer skills, and many other sports. In fact, here's a video that I want you to see of a care point that I visited together with the, the church in Riverwood, the, the group that sponsored me to go to Africa for free. This is a, a, a beautiful picture or video of a care point that receives real care from a partner church. Watch this.
So that is a care point that receives sponsorships, partners. And those people who are there are actually sponsors. They are partners. Um, it's interesting how those people who were serving uh, from that church know those kids, some of those kids personally, because they've been sponsoring them for the longest time. And they've been at it for 10 years now. And I saw the difference between a care point that has a partner and a care point that doesn't. The one that that I'm talking about, Hillview doesn't have a partner, and therefore, if you could just see the difference, I, I wish I was able to bring some pictures uh, from Hillview, and I think I, I will be asking some people to, from, from there to, to give me some photos that I could show to you in the future, but one of the things that, uh, that, that, one of the differences was that the people that you saw in the video, the kids especially, they looked healthy, they, they, they looked that they're, you know, like, like they dressed well, right, they're, they all look great. At Hillview, because there's no partnership, all they are able to provide is discipleship and food. There's not a lot of joy. There's not a lot of activeness, vivaciousness. And so my prayer is that Mosaic Church, maybe we can embrace this as a mission of justice. That 90 of us here in this church, and there's, there's more than 90 of us, Combined, we would, we would number more than 400 people. But if 90 of us would say, okay, I'm willing to donate or to give out or to give away, to set aside $1.27 a day and send it to a child in need so that I can make justice roll like a river, I'm going to do that. You'll hear more about this in the future, but who's excited about that? Come on, somebody, right? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. For some people, you know, some people would, would do it individually, or some couples would do it together, and some, some couples would say, oh, you know what, we can do more, we can do better, right? I know a couple who are, who are just dating, and they decided to adopt uh, a child, and I was like, wow, that's awesome, but you can do better, right? Um, but it's something that, that we could look forward to for 2020, make a difference and let justice roll like a river and we're getting closer to the end of this, this talk I know it's been it's been very long already but for next year we also envision partnering with a21 walk for freedom well, now what was what is a21 did you know that slave trade is not a thing of the past slave trade is happening to this very day and it's happening all over the world and it's happening even in our own backyard according to the latest data from statistics canada there were 1099 reported incidents of human trafficking here in canada now what happens to these people most of them are women under 25 years old and they're taken forcibly to work as sex slaves they are promised jobs, but they are taken captives. It happens even here in this wonderful, prosperous country. Let me ask you, does God's heart break over that? I'm sure it is. And we can bring justice. And so we want to partner with A21. It's an age, Christian NGO that fights human trafficking and sex slavery. And so, the Lord willing, on October, or in October 2020, we want to organize a citywide walk for freedom to bring awareness. What is that? That's speaking up for the people who can't speak for themselves. Bringing awareness, but not only that, to do justice. And what is that? We want to raise funds by partnering uh, with local schools and even local churches. We want to invite people all across the city to be a part of that walk of freedom. Who's excited about it? I am. Man, I am looking forward to this. We need people to be made aware that this is happening even in our own backyard. I was talking to Pastor Ta not too long ago and he said it's happening even just 23 kilometers north of us. It's happening. And we want to bring awareness and partner with this group to bring an end to this. Will it end tomorrow or next Tuesday? No. But at least we're making justice roll like a river. 
We're not just involved in making music or gathering together and feeling warm about each other. We want to make justice roll like a river. Also next year, and this has been our commitment for the last few years, although we were unable to send a team to help our partners in New York this year because of financial uh, issues of the people who signed up. We are praying to send 10 people to pray, give, and go to New York next year. November 2020. Pray about it. If that's in your heart already, you've been saying, oh, I've always wanted to go, but I don't have the money. Start saving! <laughs> Start saving now! Write to people who believe in this cause and they, they tell them, hey, would you help me? Would you support me? Start praying now. If you have a stable job, you can start saving up intentionally for this trip. If you can, like I said, if you can, if you can buy a, a peppermint mocha, right, for 525, you can set that aside. Amen. Can I hear an amen from the people of God? Yep, you can do this. If you have family and friends who believe in what you're doing or you are going to do, it's, it doesn't hurt to ask them for financial support. It's not impossible for you to go turn to your neighbor and say, it's not impossible for you to go. See if 30 of your family and friends would give you $50 each, that's $1,500. Pray about it. We want to still be involved in this to make justice roll like a river. What am I trying to do here? Hey, we're trying to do uh, local and global. Where God placed us and where God sends us. Can I hear an amen? amen? Number six. Oh, number five. In 2020, we want to be able to stage or, or organize four, say four, food drives. To support the local Salvation Army food bank. Is that something you can do? Amen. All right. So 2020, we want to do four of those, one per season, and we want to help those in need in this place. We want justice to roll like a river. Amen. Number six, and this is just seven, all right? Number six is this. Help new immigrants get settled in Canada. Who among you here was born here? Praise God. Thank you for welcoming us here. Who among you here moved here? In the recent decade. There's a lot of us. And even for me, I can attest to the fact that the reason I got settled in and I assimilated quickly is because of people who actually reached out to me and helped me. New immigrants, usually they're the ones who would scramble for furniture, right? And, and so here's what we want to do together as a family of, of believers. Help families, students and kids get settled in this country. What? What, what do we do? Hey, let's ha if you have clothing that you want to you, 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 in spare, let, let's give it. Use our new appliances, furniture, toys, whatever it is that you're able to give to a, pers to a family who is just settling here. Is this, is this something you can do? Amen. And number seven, you do not need to go far to bring justice. The measuring stick in justice is this. Do you know their name? Do you know their story? You can't fight for what you don't know. And so in your own world, the calling of God is as light to the nations so that they will know the salvation of our God. Number one, protect the vulnerable. Send care to someone in need. Befriend someone who doesn't look or sound like you. Make a covenant with your God to stay away from making unjust verdicts. God, from now on, I make a commitment to you, a holy commitment that I will never ever cast aspersions on people based on my biases, because that will prevent me from reaching out to them. And I mentioned to you different ways that we cast verdicts. Make that covenant be before God. You will never look at people the same way again. And I pray that we will not be guilty of injustice by treating people less than how God sees them. Can I hear an amen? Speak up where there is injustice, fix what is broken, stand up for what is right, and let justice roll like a river. And all of God's people said.
Let's stand to our feet and close with a word of prayer. Who's excited for 2020? Come on, somebody. All right? We're so excited that God is going to use this church to let justice roll like a river. It's 12.04. We will dismiss you with a blessing from the Lord. Uh, the words coming from Numbers. The most, most ancient blessing from the people of God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now until we meet again and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Let justice roll like a river. <laughs>